Welcome to Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park. Titans tonight with Keith Bullock, presented by Pinnacle Financial Partners. Pinnacle Financial Partners, the official bank of your Tennessee Titans. Details at titansbanking.com. Titans checking from Pinnacle. Play hard, bank easy. Pinnacle Financial Partners, member FDIC. Keith Bullock, great to see you. Great to see you. Checking out well. the injury report I left for you there. Very yeah. studiously. Do we want You're to go really ahead, studying it. Do well, we want to go ahead and dive into the injury report? Because it is quite lengthy. Well, well, can we can we do one thing before we really break down the injury report? Just, sure. just a little kind of housekeeping slash clarification slash we've got to talk about it and I can't wait. Okay. Can we do that? Sure. We don't talk a lot about Mike Keith on Twitter, and I feel like we should talk about it more. However, this one is important to me because yesterday, what, uh, roughly 24 hours ago, correct? Mike Keith takes to Twitter and tweets out Taylor Swift lyrics. <laughs> because why, why wouldn't he? And what's crazier, with no context, Mike Keith just tweets out, Taylor Swift lyrics. It's me. I'm the problem. It's me. That's what he says. No, no, no. It's me. Hi. I'm it's the problem. Me, it's me. It's me. Hi. I'm, I'm the, the problem. problem it's me. me. I'm sorry. I'm not it's a from very anti, good. It's from anti hero. I know. I'm not a very good Swifty. But he tweets these out, and the internet is going crazy. Apparently, there is context to this no context tweet that I was not familiar with. Mike Keith, care to explain? Sure. Now? Yeah. Okay. Good setup. Because I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> why the Taylor Swift lyrics? So I was informed by a so called friend yesterday. A so called friend. <laughs> Dark. That it, well, mm. that there is a Mike Keith curse and that that is the problem with the Titans right now. <laughs> I, know, I know nothing about the Mike Keith curse, I, know, I have no idea what that is. But I was told it's a thing, and so I would do anything to help the Titans win a game. You know this. Yes. And so it's me, hi. I'm the problem. It's me. Mike. So I'm taking it. I'm owning it. That's why I put it out there. But What's it, the curse? I don't, I don't know. I don't know either. But the, I want to win on Sunday. I want the Titans to win on Sunday. So if I am the problem, hi, I'm the problem, it's me. But, like, Mike, owning and acknowledging a curse does not break a curse. If you are the problem, we have to get to a, the bottom of what this is and then fix it. You can't just take ownership of it no, and I be like, I man, fixed it. You know, no, I, that's I not think how I, curses work. But I think work. I can. If he heard about it, he's taking accountability. Thank so, you. you know, know, th that's fine. Accountability does not negate said curse, though. If you're the problem, we must figure out why and then solve it. Well, <laughs> can I interject real quick? Well, sure. Just because um, once upon a time they said I was a part of the cur a curse because I slumped on a terrible towel, but the Titans have had success in years after that. Right. Just as much success as any team that I had been on. They went to an AFC championship game. Oh, yeah. You yeah. Know, so, you know, maybe yeah, that – took a long time, though, Keith. Hey, but, Wait a you minute. Know, I don't believe in curses, so Wait, that's are, first and are foremost. are we bonding cursed guy to cursed guy? Is I'm that not what's cursed. Happening? I've had a blessed life. I, like, <laughs> I had no idea that this was – Mike is trying to get it off of him. I, yeah, <laughs> I was not aware that this was – a thing, and I, you know, it, I won't say it upset me, but it's like, okay, well, if I can handle this right now, Just then I'm lean handling in. it. I'm okay. leaning in. If anybody knows, like, the terms or what exactly is, like, more information about the Mike Keith curse, please use hashtag Titans tonight and tell us more on the Twitter machine. Or, I mean, but do it's whatever fixed. you Or Mike's so called friend, send us a tweet. Yes, it's fixed. somebody, some, or like, but I told tell you. Me. Somebody look, tell me more about this. Look. I want to know more. It's me. Hi. <laughs> I'm the problem. It's me. It's very well it's done It's lyrics in that from my favorite Kansas City Chiefs fan song. <laughs> That's funny. Your favorite well, it's Kansas my current, City Chiefs fan. It's my current favorite Taylor it's, Swift song. She's on the bandwagon. Okay. Well, and that's lovely. I mean, I could have gone with Shake It Off. Nah, I think right? that's a, Whatever you it's did is a good one. Does Taylor Swift have to be a part of this? Like, do those two I mean, things go together? I mean, it felt like in today's terms, yeah, kind of did. Okay. <laughs> no, all right. I'm not – I mean, 
I, I'm just trying to understand. It was very good usage. Well, you ask usage. a serious question, and I'm just giving you a ser- It's over. It was very good it usage is, of a Taylor Swift It's clearly lyric. over. I, I am just, uh, I need to know more about this curse. I need to know more. Please. Hashtag Titans tonight. Get on Twitter. Please somebody tell me more about this Well, it's curse. over with. It doesn't feel like it is, Mike. Yeah, it does. I don't think that's how... I mean, I don't know a lot about things, but I've read a lot of Harry Potter books, and I don't think that's how curses work. Okay, time for the injury <laughs> report. <laughs> <laughs> somebody get on Twitter and tell me more. Yeah, there's nobody on Twitter. <laughs> uh, uh, I need somebody to get Titans, on Twitter. For the Titans, a lot of people didn't practice today. Tyler yeah. Boyd with a shoulder, Imani Hooker with a groin, Tony Pollard with a foot, Dylan Radins with a foot, Calvin Ridley with a shoulder, Andrew Rupsich with the triceps. Jeff Simmons got rest. Legereus Sneed out again with a quad. Tavondre Sweat with a hip. All those guys did not practice today. Limited participants. Trey Avery, hamstring. Tajay Spears, hamstring. Will Levis, right shoulder, limited. Mm. I would say that's accurate. He did some stuff. He didn't do everything. Yeah. So that's what limited is. New England, you could tell Belichick once was there because they have 400 guys. Yeah, it's a mighty <laughs> extenuous list. Yeah. The most interesting part of this, though, is Drake May concussion limited. Okay. So he did some things. Which is, as we know a the protocol back, to be. A step back from concussion protocol is doing something physical. Yeah. If he's limited, he had to do something. Which means that there there is a chance. There's a chance. There you go. Yes. Would you rather play, if you're the Titans, against Jacoby Brissett, the ninth-year man out of North Carolina State, who I think played against you in college. That's how it feels. He no, I never feel, played. <laughs> feels like he's been around <laughs> since the early 90s. He and Peyton Manning were in the same recruiting class. That's crazy. I'm actually a big fan of his. Yeah. I I'm, can't quote any of his lyrics, but I'm a big fan. <laughs> Um, You're funny today. What? No, you just made me laugh. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. But would you rather play against Drake May, the rookie from North Carolina, or Jacoby Brissett on Sunday at Nissan Stadium, Keith Bullock? Give me Drake May all day. I think, um, you know, the Titans have done – they did a great job in their first, um, you know, appearance defensively against the rookie. Um, I think um, the defensive game plans have been pretty solid this year, and I think that, um, you know, the defense coordinator does a very good job of um, knowing how to confuse, if not confuse, take away um, safety blankets for, you know, younger quarterbacks. As a general rule, I feel like because we've had this game to play a lot this year where it's would you rather go with this right. guy or this guy? As a general rule, you would rather go against a younger quarterback. Yeah, a general rule, I'd rather go against inexperience. Um, you know, you saw – Joe Flacco get in. I would have rather played against Anthony Richardson. He might have taken himself out. <laughs> <laughs> taken I think himself we all might have. Play. Um, I think he's getting but, a bad rap on that. Yeah, really? I, mean, I do. Why? Maybe a little bit, but at the same time, um, yeah, I don't – I like, look. I don't think he knew any better. You don't think he knew to not say it? No. Or I, that he didn't know that he I shouldn't have I think, rested. I think both. He's I, think, only, I think that's when you draft a kid that young and that inexperienced who really didn't even play that much at Florida, that was a lot of, of what I, – I tell you, it's an interesting story. Everybody who interviewed him at the Combine and had him in for pre-drafts or, or had time with him, I guess, at his Florida Pro Day, everybody really likes him. Mm-hmm. By all rights, he's a very nice young man. Mm-hmm. There was some fear about his lack of savvy because he was so young and he had not played that much football and he hadn't been the quarterback for a long time. That, you know, everybody went nuts because there was a point where everybody thought, oh, this guy's going to be like a third round draft pick. And then he goes out, runs four three or something, he's 6'4", 250, throws the ball 100 yards, and everybody's like, what in the world? Right. And then he goes fourth overall, 
And people said consistently, this guy needs a lot of seasoning. Okay. And I think that showed up. That's why I don't think Indianapolis is going to give up on him. While the perception from the outside is they've put Joe Flacco in, they're giving up on him. No. I don't think that's true. I think they're putting Joe Flacco in because Richards is not playing very well right now. Yeah, and they don't want to break him. Right. Okay. And they and they need to win some games. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, but I I think they I think they fully understand Anthony Richardson saying that not a good thing. Anthony Richardson tapping out for a play not a good thing. But it's not – I mean, he just threw a 300-something guy, pound guy off his back. I mean, it's not like he's scared. So, I think this, this shows us a lot about where our game is today with quarterbacks. We are bringing these guys in and – so, look at Bo Nix in Denver. Started 60 games in college, mm-hmm. and he's already playing and playing – well, what is he, like 25? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. So to to your point, and I think it's been happening for a long time, um, for a couple of decades now, and then you'll get a handful of quarterbacks that pan out. Um, our, the NFL will bring these guys in. And, you know, Anthony Richardson's a great example because even when he was being drafted and they said, you know, they're naming his attributes and all those different things, but that doesn't equate into playing quarterback, a professional quarterback right. in the NFL. So I agree with what you're saying. You know, his uh, maturation process is definitely a little behind, definitely in a sense to knowing what it takes to play quarterback in the NFL, one, let alone even play quarterback. You know, like, who is his favorite quarterback that he watched in the 12 games? You understand what I'm saying? So he's very green there. And then, you know, obviously these guys have been coddled. They've been made to believe that they are something that they're not, and they've made a few plays. They never won a national championship in college. A lot of these college athletes, I mean, college quarterbacks, maybe beside Bryce Young and C.J. Stroud and those that played at the – big time universities, you know, they never really had success, like, you know, had to really lead their team into these big time games. So now you're in the NFL, every game is a big time game, but you might not bring that sense of urgency to every play, every snap, every practice. So here's a question, and I, I can't figure out a way to phrase it that doesn't sound overly negative, and I don't intend for it to sound that way, but in that moment, where he takes the play off and then he kind of is maybe a little too honest in a press conference Way about what honest. happened. Who or what what multiple what multiple people, multiple groups, who failed him in that moment? Like where what should he have learned in that situation? What what should he have been either coached to do differently or what should he have done differently like what what's the teachable moment there is it not not to take the break well, is it no, not you to teach talk? it you teach it now because if he's coming out you think he's coming out for an injury so you don't know why he's coming out until the press conference so if right. he said oh i tweaked my ankle then it's he tweaked his ankle then we're not even speaking about this so i guess one of the teaching points is don't be so truthful but at the end of the day it goes to everything that mike initially brought up he's not mature enough to understand what it means and what it takes and you know the process of the of playing in a a playing quarterback at this level so maybe that's something he did in at uf before or in high school or something and to him like mike said could be natural like yo i'm tired real quick but let me get it but he tells the truth yeah. He tells the mm-hmm. truth and what happens? He gets murdered he gets PR wise yeah. for telling the truth. That's not. That's and not and so we you know, you've got this divergence in all of it because everybody hates the Belichick Vrabel and we got to coach harder, we got to play harder. You hate that. Mm-hmm. But then this kid, you know, and he he lays out. He goes, "Well, he goes, I was tired. I've been running around." And now he's a quitter and he's all that. And, and the reality is it's like, so what's the right answer? Right. Well, and so that's why I asked the question, not to say the Colts organization no. is failing this kid because I don't believe that even a little bit. But the the question is, okay, what are we expecting and how is he expected well, to learn And I then? think that's what the Colts are saying internally right now. Yeah. 
like but he's gonna see like he yeah. sees all the backlash and like like Mike said he's a genuinely honest and good kid so it's like he's probably sitting there like dang this is crazy like what just you know, happened why? you know like yeah, like I, examples that I've I've been around and things like that where it's one thing and then it's like a what just happened and it's like national headlines. So from that, all you could do is learn and all he could do is learn and move on from that. If he addresses it again, he probably will break it down maybe with a better context, but I think you just move on. You know, the, the center, Ryan Kelly, had some things to say about it publicly afterwards. He was not amused with his quarterback. Yeah. To me, to a certain extent, and I don't know if Ryan Kelly did this or not, but I hope he talked to him about it. I hope, you know, one of the 30-somethings on the football team, like a Ryan Kelly, a ninth-year man out of Alabama, mm -hmm. who's been a really good player, it, is that he could pull him aside and say, look, this is, this is not what we do. Yeah, yeah. And here's why. You're the guy. And it's just like the great scene – from 1999, the season opener, Titans Bengals. Titans are behind 35 to 26 midway through the fourth quarter, and Greg Williams walks over to Steve McNair, and it's picked up by NFL Films. First game ever played in the stadium we're currently in, which is now known as Nissan Stadium, and Greg Williams says, "If you believe." We will all believe. Mm -hmm. And he's telling Steve, you're the guy. You, If you believe, we will all believe. We come back and we win that game. Steve, playing with the bad back that would need mm -hmm. surgery later that week, brings us back 10 points in the last five minutes to win the game. And that's just so true, especially in this league, Quarterback in the NFL is the most important position in all of sport, regardless of sport. Certainly in team sports, individual sports, it may be different. And, but and like to add on to that, like it, the quarterback doesn't even have to be the best player because I think back to that um, 2000 um, Baltimore team, 2001 that one. Uh, Trent Dilfer was the quarterback, and nothing bad about Trent. He's a first round draft pick, played a lot of good football in this league, but he wasn't. Blowing your socks off at quarterback. He wasn't making the 40-yard play downfield. He wasn't really passing or doing much of anything but keeping – just doing his job, to he tell you the truth. Schedule. Yeah, you know what I'm yep. saying? And as a veteran quarterback, that's what they needed for that team. So it, it just kind of goes to show how important the quarterback is, whether you're the Patrick Mahomes or you're Joe Flacco. What I think is so interesting is the case study of all of this, though, because we think about the expectations of a quarterback and w how we expect them to behave on the field, off the field, in front of the media, doing all of these things. What we never really think about, or I never really thought about, was how these guys really learn how to be that person person and yeah we vet them when we're going through the pre-draft process and yeah we talk to all these people and oh yeah he's great at this he's great at that there are so many intricacies of this job that you are just expected to basically know right when you walk in the door and we're all going to sit and talk about you when you mess up and that's just the reality of having such a high profile and it, position and even if you supposedly don't play well or yeah. or even if you supposedly play well let's take it from this angle even if you supposedly play well if your team doesn't win you're not doing it right right exactly you and can do what you're supposed to you can play great and, and still it's and, your fault and it's still your fault and you you're are, not leading the right way yeah. or and you are just supposed to know like into it how all of this works for some guys as soon as you walk in the doors on day one you have to know how to do all of this. And I'm saying this kid doesn't. Right. And, and so, but then the question, because whose job is it to teach well, him? Well, it's everybody's. I, I mean, I think there are probably some assumptions that yeah. were made that he, he totally got that. And clearly he didn't. And, and again, I don't, listen, I want to beat Indianapolis every time we play them. I, well, sure. Unless yeah. they're playing Houston or Jacksonville, I don't really care. I'm not right. an Indianapolis <laughs> fan. No. But, sure are. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, Curse or no curse. I'm, <laughs> You're I'm not a, supposed I'm to not, send some of your curse yeah, up there. Yes. Well, the bottom line is 
they're not going to give up on this kid Mm -hmm. like is the – there are people perceiving today that his career with the Indianapolis Colts is over at this moment because he's a quitter. And I don't think that's – based on what I know about the interview process and the pre-draft process and just talking to some other people and Mm -hmm. and reading some people I respect who I know they know, they're trying to take him out of the equation for a step back. Mm Mm-hmm. And I want to talk about that in the situation in Nashville here with Will Levis uh, when we return with more Titans tonight with Keith Bullock and Amy Wells, presented by Pinnacle Financial Partners as you listen to Titans Radio. Titans tonight, presented by Pinnacle Financial Partners. Visit TitansBanking.com for more of Pinnacle's winning plays. Titans checking from Pinnacle. Play hard, bank easy. Pinnacle Financial Partners, member FDIC. Amy Wells is here. Keith Bullock is here. We're at Ascension St. Thomas Sports Park where the Titans practice today. Will Levis was a limited participant. And I think the first part of this, and you can explain the significance of Wednesday to Thursday. Tomorrow is the day that a lot of determinations are made due to the fact that if guys try to do something today, how they respond and what they can do tomorrow tells you quite a bit about an injury, right? Yeah. um, I have to go back to um, the beginning of the show when Amy saw me looking at this list and I was kind of shaking my head. And to be honest, that brings me to the question you just asked me. Yes, I do have some insight. Um, But when I was here, I was rarely on this. You know, so... Well, you always practice. Right. But then there would be, like, you would have Steve, who doesn't practice, but then he'll be on this list, and then he's going to show up <laughs> show up and play. <laughs> and um, Eddie, he always practiced. So you had those guys that would always practice that you knew about. So it... Is this a normal? Like, is this, like, the extent? Because I know, like, a lot of these guys are going to play, you yes. know, because they mm-hmm. take rest days. So to answer, to get more into what you asked me specifically, Wednesday is typically, you know, first and second down game plan, offensively and defensively. So the offensive coordinator is putting in what they're going to run on first and second down in the run game and pass game. Defensively, they're doing the same thing on that side of the ball. And then special teams, they're working on whatever unit they're working on on that day. And then Thursday is, um, you know, is more so blitz. So the offense is working on blitz pickup and third down pass, you know, third and short and third and long, whereas the defense is working on blitz with some run stuff mixed in, but more so for third down. You're putting in your third down packages. um, And then Friday is a culmination of everything. You know, it's like an hour, 15-minute practice and – you know, by then the coaches have it really locked in and locked down to what they're going to want to run in their first, you know, first quarter or the real plays that they're going to go with. So, um, you know, as vets, you can kind of, if you sit out on a Wednesday, you know, it's run, I could watch film on that and know where I fit in my run gap. But you really want to get out there when you're doing blitzing because there's timing involved and or you know, um, third down passing, that was important to me because I feel that's where you can make plays. That's where you can get the defense um, off the field. You know, you want to get off the field on third down. So So if you're testing an injury, and especially if it's something that's been kind of lingering and you're you're trying to get a gauge of where you are, do you want to make sure that you at least do something on Wednesday so that you see how your body reacts on Thursday? Or is it okay to wait until Thursday knowing that there might be a, a little more of an issue if it reacts poorly on Friday? Does that make sense? Yeah, plenty. Um, that's a great question. And I think um, the training staff do a great job in that because, look, if you get hurt on Sunday – you could feel better on Monday, but then feel sore on Tuesday and Wednesday. So Wednesday is the day that they ask you, like, how do you feel? You know, do, you know, and they might run some tests on you without taking you outside. And then they're like, all right, well, get on the bike, do X, Y, and Z, get your cardio, and we'll just stay off of it, whatever the injury is. Um, and then, like, something limited, like um, – 
I don't know, like a shoulder where you don't have to, and if you don't have pads or anything on, like you can go through the motions, but they might sit um, sit you out. But I say definitely Thursday because that's your last day to push it. That's your last day to go full speed because Friday is just kind of like a three-quarter speed practice because you've already gone through the bulk of the game plan. You know what you're going out there. It's almost, we call it a dress rehearsal. You're just kind of, you know, mm -hmm. as these musicians do, you're just going to right. do sound check. Yeah. So – Will hurt the shoulder one month ago today. Wow. He hurt Time the shoulder. Flies. He hurt the shoulder on September the thirtieth. It's October the thirtieth. He had thirteen days between that game and Indianapolis, and he played. And then when he tried to come back on Thursday after Indianapolis, having played a game three days earlier, he had a lot of soreness. Right. And so they've held him since then. Last week. They shut him down a great deal. And, and again, I don't know that it will be announced tomorrow. I don't even know if it will be announced on Friday. But I think they'll get a bigger feeling towards it. What I'm leading toward is this question for you, Keith. So, if he's going to use this as a positive, having watched Mason Rudolph the last two games, having – having been able to sort of step back, and that's not why this happened. They didn't, they didn't shut him down for two weeks because they wanted him to sit back and watch, mm -mm. like what we're talking about with Anthony Richardson in Indianapolis. Right. Is it more important at this time for him to be able to take the learning experience and apply it? Does he have to wait until he's 100% healthy for that to be able – to fully be the case that he can that he can apply it the best way from having been out. I say typically no, you don't have to be 100% healthy, but me personally in my opinion, I would prefer Will Levis to be 100% healthy because of something he said in a press conference after the in the game that the last game he tried to Indian play, um, he said he felt like if he like a couple of throws, he could have got out there a little further had his shoulder been 100 percent. So my thing is, all right, cool. Understood. You toughed it out. You went out there. So let's get it 100 percent so we can, you know, obviously. Calvin really got going last week. You know, they were. I felt like there were some positives in the game early with yeah. the continuity of the offense, how they were moving the ball, the game plan, the flow. Like it really looked like, okay, cool. This is this is what it should look like. You know, so I say that because it seems as if some things have gotten figured out. Um, you know. DeAndre Hopkins, obviously, he was great here, but there was some, how do we get everybody the football? Like, so, you know, if you're a Titan fan and you're watching, okay, maybe we had to alleviate some of the options for our younger quarterback or in, within the yeah, offense. Whomever However the quarterback works, is, right? yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. So, I felt like that looked good. So, I think that him coming back healthy, watching – understanding timing, understanding that you don't have to wait for the wide receiver to be open, understanding that it's okay to take the check down. And I'm not saying that these are the, the issues. I'm just throwing out young sure. things that young quarterbacks usually go through. Um, having those different understandings and whatever Coach Callahan – was trying to tell him while he was actually out there playing and for them to be able to scale it back and give him a per you see how this went and you see how because at the pros they'll cut it up they'll do a side by side okay this is you running this play <clears throat> this is mason running this play and it's one of those things those are teach tapes you know they'll give you teach tapes so you can learn so i don't know how in depth or where that is but i honestly do feel that stepping back and looking, because I think it's super cool that you can come off the field and then you got the the iPad or whatever it's called to be able to see the play in full speed. Like, that's the amazing surface, to me. They yeah, they have yeah, like, that's awesome. amazing yeah. to me. So I can only imagine being able to, you know, get a full self-evaluation, self you know, um, early in the season. I thought Brian Callahan's press conference today – was one of the most interesting coach press conferences I have ever heard. Okay, why? For the first thing, talking – the questions were excellent. 
And I thought he did a great job answering them because they they went into a lot of the questions about quarterback development, and he went deep into his philosophy on that. And then talking about Will and some of the things related to the offense. And one of the things that I found most fascinating from his overall observations about where we are at this moment, he said, the reality for me is I don't know what Will Levis is really like as a player till I see him in a real game. Yeah. He said the preseason doesn't count because he said, I don't know how he's going to react to certain things. And he didn't mean that in a bad way. What he was talking about is how is he going to react if the linebacker drops? How is he going to react if they blitz him from this end? He said, you can throw all that out, but – you know, essentially, and I'm paraphrasing, but essentially the head coach, especially when he's the play caller, has to have a book on his guys. And he talked about, now I've got an idea what Mason Rudolph's going to do in certain situations. And I'm, and I'm growing into knowing what Will likes and how he'll respond if they do certain things. So I've got to call plays anticipating that the defense might do X or Y or Z. And if you get a chance, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the press conference is up at TennesseeTitans.com. And the also t- on the app, yeah. And the Titans YouTube page, uh, the Titans YouTube channel, is that up? Potentially, I'll verify. So um, watch it, and just don't and don't go into it with, well, I'm angry about this or I'm totally supportive of this. Don't do it. Just listen to listen to the questions. I thought they were excellent, and then. And listen to what he says, because I think it was really revealing. He he really revealed in a big way where they are right now, still trying to figure out every piece of this puzzle, in particular on offense. So <clears throat> I remember when I was in college, uh, Paul Quasfiloni always used to say, it's like to young players, like, you know, you make a play and then, then you see something else and then you mess that up. And his big thing was trust. You know, can I trust you? If I put you in this situation, am I going to be able to trust you? So that's what – Coach Callahan is surfing through. Okay, who can I trust to get this done? Who's going to get this done? So when he's calling for either Mason <clears throat> or Will, he knows what not situations not to put each one of them in right. based upon what he's seen, what he's asked them, and how he's trying to calibrate his offense to, to get things going. I think that's very interesting. Also, it is on YouTube. Good. I just looked it up. So, TennesseeTitans.com, Titans YouTube channel, Titans app on your smartphone, all of those places you can get the head coach's press conference. I think it's interesting the point about him not being familiar with not only Will Levis, but all of the pieces. Right. We've seen Brian Callahan as a play caller, but, uh, but just kind of a straight-up play caller. Like, this is the play that I want – to call based on how schematically we have it designed and this how all the pieces will work. As he continues along to the point you just made, he's going to understand the nuance and the intricacies of his own players. And that is such a valuable point to know that he's calling plays based on the play themselves for the most part, as he learns what his own players' preferences, tendencies, reactions are going to be, he becomes a better play caller in the same way that the players become better at executing the plays. That's a good point. Because he's able to call based on who's out there, and it's more than just what they are athletically gifted to do. It's what they will anticipate, what they will prefer, what they will react to. These are things that – you you can't get them until you have spent until time together them. doing yeah, <laughs> yeah until you get them yeah. and it takes that time to develop that understanding in both ways so i i think that's such a valuable call out by you mike and it's such a valuable point for everyone to remember that every part of this is is a learning experience for every person involved. And it's not just learning how to do the job. It's learning the ways to do this and job. And it's learning one another. Yeah, it's learning each other and learning the ways to do this job in a way that's the most effective for every single person who has a role in it. And that's such valuable context. Yeah, for sure. But it's also a thin line. 
people have to do their job. There's a yes, thin line 100%. between understanding and, mm-hmm. oh, you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. all that being said, abs- absolutely um, 1,000% on, on, you know, you just wrapped it up. Well, you think about this. It's the 50th anniversary of the Rumble in the Jungle. Wow. George Foreman got rope a by Muhammad Ali. Oh. And yeah. jo- George Foreman could punch. Probably nobody outside of Mike Tyson in the history of boxing could punch quite like George Foreman. Maybe even Tyson didn't have the the devastating right hand. But the point was Ali was the greater overall fighter because he could counter. Mm. He could counter anything. He could do he could do offense and defense. And that's where they've got to get to now with this offense. And especially I think it will show up in the second half. They don't need to rope a dope in the first half, Mm-mm. but they need to be able to counter in the second half of games. That, to your point, is part of him knowing these guys better, mm-hmm. him trusting these guys more, mm-hmm. and they take play number one, and they're like, okay, they did this when we ran play number one. Now I'm going to counter off this. Mm-hmm. Now I'm going to go deep. Now I'm going to do, do something else in the second half to take advantage of it. I don't think he's had a lot of the counter moves available to him because the – He didn't get to see it on play number one. He did. Mm-hmm. Right. And, yeah. And also the overall cohesion in all of this. If, they, if they've got a good call, the protection is broken down. The, the receiver hasn't been where he's supposed to be. The quarterback hasn't thrown the ball on time. All these things have been happening. The Titans are a football team that are a lot better – individually than they are as the sum of the parts right now. Yeah. And yeah. and they've got to pull that part together because how they've played, when you just look at the roster 1 through 53, you think, well, this team's better than last year. Mm-hmm. How can this be? Well, it's the ultimate team game. Yeah, mm-hmm. it really is. It's almost like, you know, uh, we're on radio. You put together a new radio show. You get three different great personalities. Right. You want it to work right away. And, you know, it might be terrible the first two weeks until everyone finds, okay, this is where I come. Everybody has to find their role into how to make it work properly. So, team's game. Yeah. And I is. throw to break. That's a, And a I great got to time. mention Rumble in the Jungle, too. Yeah. And he was you like, did. what? Well, it, it was my brain didn't go in that direction until you said it. And I was like, oh, yeah, there you go. I was just a little we slow on you, the uptake. Game. That's what uh, the ultimate team game radio the is. The ultimate ta- team game radio yep. is indeed. <laughs> Pinnacle Financial Partners, Titans Tonight with Keith Bullock and Amy Wells continues on Titans Radio. New England comes in to the game on Sunday, two and six. Their head coach is Gerard Mayo, the former Patriots linebacker. You played against him. I did. His offensive coordinator is Alex Van Pelt, who played in your first ever NFL game. Buffalo Bills. Came off the bench to lead the Bills to a game-winning field goal. Hmm. Demarcus Covington is the defensive coordinator. The Patriots don't make a lot of mistakes. They are just minus one in turnover ratio. They've only given the ball away eight times in eight games. Wow. Titans are minus 13 in turnover ratio. That would be more. Which is crazy. Yeah. Uh, Patriots, 261 yards per game total offense, 111 rushing, 150 passing. Leading rusher, Ramondre Stevenson, 104 carries, 422 yards and five touchdowns. Another big back. This one out of Memphis, Antonio Gibson, 56 carries, 236 yards. Leading receiver is Hunter Henry, a tight end, 32 catches, 358 yards, and one touchdown. Kickers Joey Sly, 11 of 13 on field goals. Do you realize this is weird, just weird, goofy fact for Titans tonight? There has not been a kick missed in a Titans game this year. Really? There is it. The opponent hasn't missed a field goal or an extra point, and the Titans haven't missed a field goal or an extra point. I don't love. Isn't that weird? That. I think it's weird. It, yeah, I mean, you want to talk about curses? What? Why would you say that out loud? Well, maybe it curses New England. Yeah, maybe. But maybe I'm optimistic. It, it curses New England. Thank you, Keith. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> As I stare at Amy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
their punter, me down. Their punter is Bryce Beringer, <laughs> averaging nearly 51 yards a kick. He has 20 downed inside the 20. Wow. Which is pretty good. Yeah. Their defense allowing 357 yards a game, 133 rushing, 224 passing. Leading sacker is Keon White out of Georgia Tech with four. They have three guys with one interception. They won their opener at Cincinnati 16-10. to Then they lost to Seattle in overtime, lost at the New York Jets, got hammered, uh, lost at San Francisco, got hammered, lost to Miami 15-10, to lost to Houston, got hammered, lost to Jacksonville in London 32-16, to and then beat the Jets last Sunday. Yeah. A really impressive win. Rallied the troops. Rallied to win 25-22. Mm-hmm. So that's who the opponent is this week at Nissan Stadium. Woohoo! Two and six on the year. Rookie head coaches. Let's get there. Let's it's like the number. It's like the Ron Earhart days back in. You wouldn't remember, but the Patriots were they were pretty bad for a long time. I remember the. Um, I don't know what was. Hmm. Chuck, who, Chuck Fairbanks was that their head coach? Yes, he was a good coach. No, no, no. Um, and McPherson was a head coach from yes. Syracuse. Bill McPherson, uh, um, Don or uh, Dick McPherson. Dick yes. So it's like in the eighties, right? I'm talking yeah. About, and yeah. then Raymond Barry took that's, it to that's, the Super Bowl. That's, that's really what I'm remembering. Yes, like, they were bad, and then Raymond Barry. Raymond Barry and did it. They got bad, and again. he lives in Murfreesboro, by the way. In real life. The great, yep, the great oh, Raymond Barry, who's a Hall of Famer. You need to meet me at Toots one day. <laughs> Maybe. Just, Maybe talking. he's listening right now. So, probably not. <laughs> um, All right. He's got better things to do. I'm sure he doesn't. <laughs> but he was Johnny Unitas' receiver with the Colts. Yes. And, and then they kind of went through a few things. Mm. And then Bill Parcells came in. Well, th- who was there first was Pete Carroll. Interesting. And then Pete Carroll took over for Bill Parcells. Or, no, Bill, Bill Parcells, Parcells took, took over, over for, for Pete, Pete Carroll. Carroll. I'm tracking with you. And then Belichick came in and – The rest is history. They won the division 11 straight years. Yeah, that's wild. A break and then back with final thoughts on this edition of Titans Tonight on Titans Radio. Titans Tonight headlines in the final minute. Bud Adams has made it – to the semifinals with eight other, sem- with a total of nine semifinalists, eight other semifinalists in the contributor category for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Woohoo! Mr. Adams is with Ralph Hay, Bucko Kilroy, Robert Kraft, Art Modell, Art Roney Jr., um, Seymour Swyoff, Doug Williams, and John Wooten. Man. So we'll see if Mr. Adams can Keep get moving the, on. So the idea it. is get that one person will emerge from there and will be voted on and will the, the one person will one will person get in from that nine from that nine. Let's oh. go, bud. Yes. Come on, let's go, man. bud. Put him in. Put you know him what? In. Put him in the if hall. If he don't get in, I'm going to post a picture to my social media f- expressing how I feel about that. Is it going to be a certain picture? It's going to be a certain but out of picture. <laughs> <laughs> Put the man in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, they have that pin. I need to get that Bud Adams pin. <laughs> it does to, exist. I need to – I know somebody's listening to me. <laughs> Mike's like, yo, I'm out on this one. Will, Just put him in the Hall of Fame. Will Levis didn't practice fully today. <laughs> he, uh, he, had, he was <laughs> – Need that pin. He was limited – but he did practice. He did. I saw him throw the football. So yep, he was out there. He was out there. Woohoo! And uh, so we move towards New England again. It is a noon game at Nissan Stadium. That's noon Central Time. And of course, you turn your clocks back this weekend. Don't forget, or you'll miss the first quarter. Extra hour of sleep. Yeah, get the sleep. Turn your clocks back. Check your smoke detectors. Thanks for joining us for Titans tonight.